Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on positive parenting during shelter in place. My name is Dr. Nicole Staracci, and I'm a psychologist in the Stanford Medical School's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health. This webinar is the first in a three part series on positive parenting hosted by the psychiatry department with, this, um, with the support of WellMD. The next webinar in this series is upcoming on Monday on communicating as a family in times of crisis. And the third is on Thursday, May 14th on adapting to change, maintaining structure and keeping families healthy. Our colleagues at Continuing Medical Education have worked hard with short timeframes to make sure webinars like this um, are eligible for CME credits. Instructions for how to receive CME credits are listed on this slide. You might wanna take a screenshot, um, but we will also return to this slide at the end of the webinar. The past month with sheltering in place has been a challenging time for many parents. As we are frequently having to adapt to changing circumstances, such as schools closing and taking on caretaking and teaching roles that may be new for us, in addition to our roles as healthcare workers. These changes can strain relationships and lead to new parenting uh, challenges. Today, we're fortunate to hear from Dr. Elizabeth Richer and Dr. Shay Fedigan, who are both child psychologists in the Department of Psychiatry's Pediatric Anxiety and Traumatic Stress Clinic. Dr. Recher is a clinical assistant professor and the director of the Pediatric Anxiety Clinic and the co-director of the General Child Psychiatry Clinic. She's an expert in parent-child interaction therapy, an evidence-based intervention that teaches positive parenting strategies and specializes in supporting anxious youth and their caregivers. Dr. Fedigan is a clinical assistant professor in the Pediatric Anxiety Clinic. She completed her postdoctoral training here at Stanford, worked at Boston Children's, and fortunately for us, returned to us here recently. She also has expertise in parent-child interaction therapy and parenting strategies for managing anxiety in youth. The work of both Dr. Recher and Dr. Fedigan aims to promote health and resiliency within families. Thank you both for taking this time to share your knowledge with us today. Today's webinar will be divided into two parts. Dr. Recher and Dr. Fedigan will present for approximately 30 minutes and will respond to questions afterwards. Please submit your questions through the chat function located at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for being with us today, and we look forward to hearing your questions. Now I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Recher and Dr. Fedigan. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Strachey. Welcome, everyone. So today we're going to discuss the fundamentals to positive parenting. Why the fundamentals when coping with these unprecedented challenges and increased demands for parents and kids? Well, what we know is that in times of complexity, the fundamentals are even more important. This is apparent even with the current pandemic. COVID-19 is a complex virus that has impacted each of us. And yet, with its complexity, it's highlighted the importance of fundamental elements to health, washing your hands. So today, we shift to the fundamentals that will ground you in what you can do in these challenging times. Next slide, please. So despite your official title as mom, dad, parent, your unofficial but very accurate title is as teacher. This role may seem even more apparent to some of you in your current life as many parents have shifted to also acting as their formal classroom teacher for their children during distance learning. But regardless, you are a potent guide for your child. They learn from how you cope, how you behave not simply from what you directly say to them, but from what they see you do and what they experience within your relationship with them. Children react to how those around them are responding, and we're in a position to model how to respond and cope with what's going on. Now, I know this is a tall order, 
But one thing can be very helpful to remember. Behavior can and will change over time. New behaviors can be developed. Old or unhelpful behaviors can be unlearned. Your children are malleable and you're their guide. Next slide, please. So if you're the tool through which your child will learn, developing the optimal learning environment means that taking care of yourself is critical. Self-care in the form of taking a few minutes of a day to yourself is not only important, but vital. We need to have you put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Sometimes self-care includes just lowering your expectations for yourself of what needs to be done. We're gonna to talk today a lot about the importance of setting your child up for success by setting clear and achievable expectations. We recommend you do the same thing for yourself. Be honest with what you can reasonably accomplish as a teacher right now and accept that is enough. But it's not just what we teach, but how we teach it that impacts the learning environment. We wanna create the optimal and consistent teaching style. So when kids are experiencing large emotions or behavioral swings, the situation is ripe for our own emotions to match theirs in intensity. But what do they learn in that? It adds fuel to an unwieldy fire and we lose a teaching opportunity. In moments of intensity, we wanna lend kids our calm our stability. We want to model for them the behaviors and responses we wish for them to develop. When they are rigid, be flexible. When they're yelling, talk calmly. When they're ranting, just listen. Not only does this help diffuse the situation, but it also helps to show them how to cope rather than telling them. And yes, there is a time for telling and how we tell matters. So when we do tell a kid what we need from them, taking a warm but firm stance communicates care, but it also maintains a po and positive relationship while making sure their expectation is clear. Next slide, please. Transparency about not knowing everything can be incredibly helpful to children, but it's how you do that transparency that's critical. Remember, that it's not their job to manage our anxiety and to take care of us. It's our job to take care of them. So it's important they know this. We cannot stress this enough. And we encourage you to attend our, some of our upcoming webinars later this week and next week to learn more about ways to manage your own stress during this time. But a great way to be transparent about challenges in a manner that doesn't open children up to your worry is through coping language. So modeling coping language can help validate the reality of the challenges right now, while also focusing on our ability to cope and get through this. So saying something like, I know this is hard and we don't know what's gonna happen this summer, but I do know we're gonna figure it out together. This helps acknowledge the uncertainty of the moment and builds hope and encouragement that there can be some stability. You will get through this and problem solve together. It's important to reassure your child and your teen that they and your family are safe and you are doing everything you can to maintain their safety during a time of instability. With so much control being taken away from kids, talking about things your child can do to stay safe can empower them to have a sense of control. It's also a great opportunity to review with them the CDC and the WHO recommendations for staying healthy so they know that there are people out there supporting them in instability. So your behavior and responses are also a means of communication and are ways that we can help provide reassurance that kids need. Modeling coping language will help to build bravery in your child's capacity to tolerate the distress and uncertainty of these times. Next slide, please. So if your behavior is a means of communication for your children, kids' behavior is a means of communication too. That is, kids' behavior has a function or a purpose. Parents often personalize their kids' behavior and think that they're doing it on purpose, but parents are totally right. In fact, kids are doing it on purpose. It's just not the purpose we think it is. All children misbehave sometimes. But more often than not, that behavior is actually typical for their developmental age, and its purpose isn't to voluntarily disobey. 
Rather, the purpose of kids' behavior typically falls into one of three kind of main categories. To obtain something they want or need, to get attention, whether that attention is positive or negative, or to escape or avoid something. They often aren't actively aware of what it is they want or need that's driving the behavior, although sometimes they are. They just know they need something and they express that behaviorally. This includes emotions too. Kids can express their emotions through their behaviors. This is even more true in times of change when an environment is unstable or changing, such as times of transition and uncertainty. Those are when we can see an increase in behavioral challenges both from the inherent difficulties of the situation, but also due to children's difficulty emotionally adapting to the situation. Next slide, please. So this brings us to the current context, shelter in place and beyond. Shelter in place has left us ripe with opportunities to have to adapt and change. And with each new challenge and change, each moment of instability, we're provided with an environment rich for some of the most powerful learning opportunities and experiences for our children and our families. In fact, there are opportunities not only to learn new behaviors, but to foster resilience. Resilience is fostered when part of a system can remain stable while the other adapts to change. So today we're gonna to talk about principles of how to keep a system stable through predictable parenting responses during a time when the context is ever changing. How to provide some sense of what kids can expect while also teaching them how to cope with when we just don't know what to expect. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? With what we attend to. Our attention as parents functions as a powerful guide to reinforce behavior. Regardless of the behavior, whether it's a helpful behavior or an unhelpful behavior, the more we attend to a kid's behavior, the more likely it is to occur again. It doesn't matter whether we're giving negative attention, like stop, don't do that, knock it off, or positive attention through hugs, praise, rewards. The greater the amount we attend to a behavior, the more likely it is to occur. So if a behavior has a purpose, then by even partially fulfilling it, kids learn that they can get something out of that behavior. They'll get the attention and they'll be more likely to use that behavior or something similar again in the future. Next slide, please. So knowing that what we attend to is making behavior more likely to increase, we wanna use that to help shape up the behaviors and skills we want kids to be learning and doing. Be selective and choosy in what you give your attention to. Two of the most powerful parenting skills are focusing your attention on things kids are doing well and you wanna see more of and shifting focus away from the behaviors you do not want to continue and you want to decrease. Next slide, please. Labeled praise is the active ingredient in teaching kids what behaviors we want them to do. Often we all take for granted the many, many great behaviors our kids do all day. And instead, we end up solely commenting on the negative behaviors. Labeled praise shifts that framework to teaching and focusing on what we do see that we like and what they are doing well. It shines a light on these behaviors. So what makes labeled praise different from the praise you're likely already giving your kids is that it combines the praise, that thank you, great job, with the specific behavior you like and want to see more of, playing gently, talking quietly while you're on a video call. So instead of saying, great job, thanks so much, say, great job playing so quietly while I was on a video call. I really appreciate your help today. In new contexts, kids often just don't know or don't remember what behaviors you want from them or you need from them. And labeled praise is a helpful way to tell them what you're doing that they love so they can learn new behaviors. Keys to making labeled praise as potent as possible when you do use it is having it be immediate. As soon as you see the positive behavior, tell them. Also be specific, say exactly what behavior you like. So rather than saying, thanks for doing your homework, shift it to, thanks for doing your homework so independently. 
labeled praise can also be a powerful tool for shaping longer term goals by praising any kind of incremental improvement towards it. So for example, if an ultimate goal for your child, like for many people, is for them to do some homework and schoolwork independently for maybe 30 minutes, they likely may not be able to do this right away. But let them know the expectation that you want them to do schoolwork independently for 30 minutes, but maybe set some smaller incremental goals, such as studying for five or 10 minutes independently before you check back in on them. And then praise each of those steps towards completion. So rather than waiting till the end of the 30 minutes to praise them, where they may not be set up for success, praise them after 10 minutes. I'm so impressed. You just worked for you by yourself for 10 minutes. Fantastic job working so independently. This will help shape the behavior to a longer term goal. Next slide, please. Active ignore is choosing to not give attention or ignore to the behaviors you want your child to do less or not at all. It's like removing the oxygen to a behavior. If we know that the behavior has a function or a purpose, by actively ignoring the behavior, it takes away its ability to fulfill its function. So to actively ignore you are purposefully, intentionally not attending to the behavior in the eyes of your child. In reality, you're very much attending to them and focus on what they're doing. You're just not showing them that. So ways to actively ignore is to not engage with them. This may be a time when they're trying to hook you by saying like, you're not listening or you don't care. Do not verbalize and get hooked onto that. It can be a challenge, but rather turn away or look away. Do something else. This can be a great time to try to catch up on some work emails. A caveat is you're probably not gonna be very productive in getting those emails done, but your child doesn't know that. They see that you are not attending to their behavior while they're doing this undesired behavior. And ways to make this active ignoring as potent as possible when you're using it is that the moment your child shifts away from an undesired behavior and does any form of a desired behavior or a behavior you like, give them labeled praise. This makes it a powerful learning moment where you can see that you can rebound from undesired behaviors. And in fact, this attention you're drawing to the positive behavior teaches them that this is what you want to see. This is how you will engage with them. So together, active ignore and label praise really function as like a light switch. We turn our attention on to all the behaviors we love seeing, we wanna see more, and we wanna shine light to. And we turn our attention off to any unhelpful behaviors, behaviors we wanna see less of and that we wanna keep in the dark. So active ignore is a fantastic skill for a wide range of undesired behaviors. It's great for dawdling, complaining, yelling, sassing, arguing. But we want to be very clear there are some behaviors we can never ignore and in fact it's imperative we do not ignore them. So we should never ignore safety concerns like hitting or hurting or destructive behaviors like breaking objects that could be harmful. Danger behaviors should always be addressed right away because these are learning opportunities too. This behavior is unsafe. We need to choose something different. Dr. Richer will speak a little bit more about how to address those danger behaviors and how to optimize learning if and when they do occur. Dr. Richer. Thank you, Dr. Fred, again. Um, so now I really want to first focus on two strategies that we can use on a daily basis to help with setting the stage for success. These are what I really like to think of as, as proactive or preventative strategies. So in a time that's changing so rapidly and with so much that's unpredictable, we must be intentional about setting some structure and routine to the week. Setting up what I like to refer to as flexible routines can be just that. This helps to really build that sense of stability within an ever-changing environment. Creating a daily schedule can help to chunk the day. As you see on the right side of your screen here, there are no explicit times on the schedule or even time frame. Instead, this offers a visual representation of the flow of the day and helps to chunk the day into meaningful activities. 
after lunch, we have quiet time. After quiet time, we have activity time. After activity time, we have dinner time, and so on. For some families, a more general daily expectation chart may, may be more helpful. And this is where we might set an intention or a couple of goals for each day. You can find many examples of these on Google, as well as in our, one of our upcoming webinars that we're, where, we'll, where we will talk more about this um, and give you more ideas of how, how to set those routines up. Offering options to our children to choose from can also really help to introduce that flexibility within the schedule. So you get to determine as the parent what those options are, but your child gets the opportunity to exert control over the actual choice. So for younger kids, we find that two choices can go a really long way. Whereas for elementary age kids, we tend to recommend three to four options. And for tweens and teens, engaging in more of a collaborative process of identifying what the options are to get all together can help really with that buy-in. Next slide, please. So as we consider routines to be essential in setting the stage for optimal learning and creating stability, the way we prompt can be equally as important when it comes to getting our child to complete a task or especially engaging in those more less, those less preferred activities. So let's review just a few ingredients for being successful with prompting. So first, we really want to be specific and direct. We want to tell children exactly what we expect or what we want them to do, as opposed to focusing on what we don't want them to do. And we want to do this in a way that's calm, that's neutral and polite. We want to avoid using terms such as no, don't, stop, quit, as these are negatively phrased and can really focus more on the behaviors we want to be avoiding. We also want to avoid creating an opportunity for an option. So removing the could you do this or would you do that takes out the idea that this prompt you're giving is optional. So for instance, if you want your child to stop yelling at his sister, instead of saying, stop yelling at your sister, or would you please stop yelling, which may be our typical go-to, especially right now, <laughs> we want instead to try to say, Charlie, I need you to please use a quieter voice. By focusing on what we want our child to do, we're helping to clarify the expectation. And we're bringing our attention and theirs to the positive behavior. By being polite and by being matter of fact, we're modeling calm and socially appropriate behavior all at the same time. So as parents, we have all fallen guilty of overloading on prompts. How many of you sometimes get up in the morning and feel like a broken record? or even like a drill sergeant. Charlie, it's time to get up, come down for breakfast, take your feet off the table, be nice to your sister, stop chewing with your mouth open. Come on, we have to get ready for learning time. Get your clothes on. Wait, put your dishes in the dishwasher. Why are you not dressed yet? Did you brush your teeth? Pick up your clothes, stop yelling at your sister. And it goes on and on and on. Whether we like it or not, we find ourselves running through many, many prompts throughout the day and often have, having to end up yelling to get our children to listen. This is actually so common in our role as parents that there's a great comedian on YouTube who recorded a song about this known as the mom song. I encourage you to Google it, check it out, especially if you're looking for a little laugh. So what is the takeaway here? When we rattle off prompt after prompt, they lose their effectiveness. And often we're not even giving our kids a chance to complete the first task that we prompted for. So we want to really try to avoid overloading and getting tuned out and reserve our prompts for the things that really need to happen or those things that really matter. Similarly, we wanna make sure that we're giving one prompt at a time. So this is gonna be especially true for our younger kids. Teens can typically handle a few prompts at once, but you also know your teen best. Just remember, less is going to be more in this case. Front loading is also key in this process. So are you sick of hearing why every time you ask your child to do something? Front loading offers a reason or a rationale and gives your child advanced warning about what's gonna happen. This can really help to reduce the tendency for our kids to engage in those, those negotiation or those delay strategies. 
And so an example of this might be saying something like, Charlie, I have something I need to complete for work. Please help your sister with her math problem. Or Charlie, it's almost time for dinner. Please set the table. Now, if Charlie follows the prompt, here is the key to making this all work. We must be sure to immediately praise. Charlie, I really appreciate that you helped your sister with bath while I work. Or thank you so much for setting the table. While this sounds so simple, the number of times that we forget to praise our kids for doing the things that we told them to do is actually a lot. When kids are listening to us, our days go on. Things go more smoothly. When kids don't listen, this creates roadblocks and potentials for power struggle. And this is what we end up bringing our attention to more. So hopefully by now you're picking up a little bit on the theme that Dr. Fedigan and I are trying to share with you. But the behaviors we bring our attention to are gonna be the ones that we end up seeing more of. So we tend to bring more attention to the times kids don't listen than the times that they actually do. And we wanna shift this balance. And so prompting for the behavior that we want or for the positive behavior is going to help increase the likelihood that it, that it happens. And every time your child re responds to a prompt, praising or acknowledging their compliance is going to increase the likelihood that they will do it again. I want you to think for a moment about the best boss that you've ever worked for. Did they praise or acknowledge your hard work from time to time? Or did they just load up your task list day after day? The boss that stands out the most is likely the one who acknowledged your efforts. When our efforts are noticed, it feels good and we're motivated to do more. Next slide, please. So what do we do when kids don't listen? Or when kids are engaging in those dangerous or destructive behaviors Dr. Fedigan was mentioning earlier? First, it's essential that we provide an opportunity for a child to try to correct their behavior and make the right choice. For this, we can use something as simple as a warning. Charlie, if you don't help your sister, then we're not gonna be able to play the game we plan to play after learning time today. Or Sally, if you can't play, if you can't play gently with the toys, then you're gonna have to go to timeout. Or Jordan, if you don't turn off your video games, you're not gonna be allowed to play later. These are great examples of warnings as they let Charlie, Sally, and Jordan know what is expected and what's going to happen if they don't listen. When kids don't respond to our warnings, that's when consequences can be used. And so consequences are gonna vary depending on a child's age and really depending on the situation. So time out is a parenting technique that can be used with young children and refers really to time out from all types of reinforcement. And this includes time out from your attention, toys, screen time, and so on. Time out should be used in a predictable and consistent manner so that your child is really familiar with the procedure and what to expect. By making this process highly predictable, we're really helping to promote our young children's learning. And for kids this age, a specific short period of time is really all that's needed. And we really like to recommend only three minutes of timeout with five seconds of quiet. Timeout is effective because it's intended to be boring or free from reinforcement, but also safe and helps children to gain emotion regulation skills and self-control. Loss, loss of privilege is another form of a consequence and can be great for kids ages about six and up. It also comes in a variety of forms. But simply put, loss of privilege really just refers to removing a preferred activity or an object for a period of time following misbehavior. So for kids on the younger side, this can be removing a favorite toy or a game. And for teens, it may be removing their video game or TV watching privileges. Similar to timeout, we really wanna remember that this is only a brief removal. Contrary to popular belief, the longer we remove something, the less of an impact it has and the harder it is to actually enforce. So for younger kids, removal for an afternoon or an evening can be enough. And for teens, a 24-hour period can suffice. 
When it comes to privileges, we also never want to remove a privilege that's actually going to impact us more. So what do I mean by this? If you have an important work call this afternoon and had planned to have your child watch TV during that time, then removing TV time as a privilege is not only going to be a consequence for them, but may actually be even more impactful for you. So you want to be sure to think through your consequences, consult with your parenting partners when you can, and to the best of your ability, decide what's going to be best in that moment, both for your child and for you. Natural and logical consequences are another form of consequences that happen as a result of our children's actions. So for example, you might recommend that your teens stop fighting over the remote control and they end up arguing for so long that their TV show is over. Or you might tell your child that they must wear their helmet while they ride their bike and they refuse to listen. So then the consequence would be that your child is not allowed to ride their bike that morning and has to walk instead. These types of consequences are reasonable and related to the problem. They result from children, from, from children making certain choices about their behavior, and they give children a chance to learn what's going to happen when they don't behave in the way that you expect. There's no shame or intense punishment here. We are simply helping children learn how to be responsible for their own actions. So most importantly, out of any of these forms of consequences we've just reviewed, Consequences are going to teach children that even when they misbehave, parents will treat them respectfully and consistently. And following any consequence, we recommend parents return to their positive parenting strategies to offer emotional support and positive reinforcement for all appropriate behaviors. The bottom line is consequences can be effective in stopping the behavior in the moment, but they simply won't work on their own. If we are not teaching our children what we want them to do by praising and attending to the appropriate behavior and by making efforts to set the stage for success, then we can expect our children to know what is appropriate and how we want them to behave. Next slide, please. So we've just reviewed a handful of skills that science has really shown us to be the foundations to building positive behavior with our children. And one thing that we notice most when challenging behaviors are present is that the relationship between parents and their kids is often suffering. And especially during coronavirus, our relationships are being tested. And so as we've discussed, kids with difficult behaviors are gonna be much more likely to be receiving negative attention from us than positive attention. And so how do we reset this balance? A guideline that can be really helpful to keep in mind is that for every negatively phrased comment, like, stop yelling at your sister, we want to have five positive phrases. Remember those labeled, labeled phrases that Dr. Fedigan had taught us earlier? Those are going to be incredibly powerful in shifting this sound. Next slide, please. A daily dose of positive connection can be the best place to put these skills into action. Special time is about setting aside a small amount of time each day to connect with your child without any agenda. Especially on those days that have been particularly difficult, special time can help to reset the balance and break the negative cycle of behavior. It gives you and your child something to look forward to and can reinforce a sense of security and safety. Now, I get it, you may be thinking, how in the world do they expect me to add anything else to my day when I'm already struggling to get by? I hear you, it's hard. But the best part about special time is that it doesn't require any more than five minutes for it to have a powerful impact. So for younger kids, this can be done with as little as five minutes of child-directed playtime. For older children, especially our teens, taking a moment just to check in and sit together, engage in something they are interested in, can go a really long way. This is not the time for problem solving or for reviewing how much schoolwork they got done that day or even reviewing what's on the agenda for tomorrow. It is simply about connecting without an agenda, without efforts to correct or control and being present with one another. 
I really like to think about this as a daily powerful dose of positivity and a manageable way to practice all of the positive parenting skills that we've just been discussing. Next slide, please. Active listening and validation are strategies that are gonna to help to further enhance the connection with your child. They can be used during special time and they can also be used throughout the day. So in a time that's so uncertain and with so many changes to our day-to-day -day lives and more to come, children need to feel listened to and taken care of. And making sure that they feel heard is gonna to help to create that sense of stability and security. For younger kids, we can do this by engaging in things like reflection. So if your child says, I did it all by myself, you would say something like, yes, you did do it all by yourself. Reflections allow your child to be in the lead of the conversation. They show that you're listening and understanding and brings your attention and focus to your child. Behavior descriptions, such as giving a play-by-play, -play, kind of almost like being that sportscaster about what your child's doing is gonna to help to bring attention to those positive behaviors and really help to increase your concentration and especially theirs on their activity and increase that mindful engagement. And those labeled phrases again can be used here because they're gonna really help to increase the desired behaviors and really let your child know what, they, what you like to see and how much you're enjoying that time together. They're gonna to add warmth to your interactions. They're gonna help increase your child's self-esteem and so on. So with teens, it's important to try to make eye contact, to nod, and to demonstrate genuine interest in whatever it is that, that they're doing or you're talking about. A mom recently shared with me that she despises video games, not because of the fear that her teen is going to get addicted to them or anything like that, but really because she just doesn't get them. She doesn't understand the, the draw. She finds them utterly boring. And so, of course, what is her teen's favorite thing to do? It's play Fortnite all day, every day, if he could. <laughs> so the other night, it took everything in her to sit down on his bed while he played. Skeptical at first, her son slowly warmed up to the idea of having her be there. And by the end, he was showing her all the ins and outs of the game and expressing some genuine interest and excitement in having her be with him and happiness in that moment with his mother. His mom later reflected to me that she hasn't experienced that side of his personality in so long, and it felt so good to be connected in that moment. It was clear that this small gesture offered a potent moment of connection and positivity for the two of them. This mom has now made an effort to sit with him, not every night, but for a few minutes every other day, and she's noticing a really powerful shift in their relationship. It is not perfect. They still fight. He still struggles to listen, but they do have this moment to look forward to together. So in addition to listening, we want to make sure that we're also validating. We want to acknowledge how children are feeling and reflect what we've heard. So saying something like, I know it's hard not to be able to see your friends right now. I'm, I'm really missing my friends too. Let's try to figure out if there are any other ways you can see them without leaving home. Or I understand it's really disappointing not to be able to walk in graduation with your friends and get your diploma in person. Or even a simple, I hear you, can go a really long way. As you can see, we are not trying to be corrective or prescriptive. We are simply listening and acknowledging what our child is saying. This will inevitably increase the quality of the moment with your child and is, given, is going to give your child the space they need to really think through what it is that they want to be talking about or sharing with you. And it's going to help to encourage their engagement. A trap that we can commonly fall into is to actually respond defensively in certain moments like this. So an example of this might be when your teen says something to the effect of, I hate you, you never listen to me. For those with teens, it's likely you've heard this phrase once or twice before. For many of us, our, immediately re our immediate response is gonna be to go on the defensive and say something like, no, that is not true. I try to listen to you all the time. And yet 
this is not the moment that we want to be trying to defend or trying to correct. Instead, saying, wow, that must feel really bad to think that I never listened to you. This is going to help to diffuse the situation. By validating your teen, you are not trying to change your teen's feelings about that particular situation. You are simply letting them know that you've heard them and that how they're feeling is valid and okay. Sometimes it can take a lot of practice to really find the best way to validate your child. And so we really encourage you not to give up, especially if your child doesn't respond at first. Next slide, please. So finally, we really wanna emphasize that you have been and you are teaching your children how to problem solve and how to cope with one of the greatest times of unknown and disruption this generation has ever faced. Parenting is hard and parenting during a pandemic has made our jobs even harder. It is so important that we are patient with ourselves and our families. Children react to how those around them are responding. And we are in that unique position to model how to respond and how to cope with what's going on. We hope that by reviewing the fundamental principles of positive parenting today with you, that this has really helped remind you that in fact, you know what to do and you have the tools to do it. But you must remember that you have to put your own oxygen mask on first. Behaviors can and will change over time. New behaviors can be developed, new behaviors can be shaped, and unhelpful behaviors can be unlearned. Your children are malleable and so are you, and you are their guide. So we want you to take a moment and ask yourself, in six months, in a year, in 10 years from now, what do you want to be remembering about this time? What do you want your kids to be remembering about this time? Allow the answers to these questions to guide you. Remember that resilience is fostered when part of the system can remain stable while also adapting to change. It is okay to be reducing expectations if and when possible during this time. Allow time for each transition and allow yourself to be open for the bumps that are going to come along the way. Take the time you need to reflect on what's working and what's not working and to be flexible in that process. As we begin to anticipate life beyond shelter in place, remember that it will be a balance between providing a sense of what kids can expect while also modeling how to cope with not knowing what's to come. So while we can't solve it all, especially not today in a one hour webinar, we can come back to the basics and know that tomorrow is always an opportunity to try again. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Rocher. We've listed here some additional resources that we'd like to provide for you. Our clinic, the Pediatric Anxiety <clears throat> and Traumatic Stress Clinic has developed some helpful handout that is frequently being updated and is available from this um, link here. Um, that can guide you on ways to talk with your children, stress reducing activities, and different things for different age levels. We recommend you check it out and see what you might find that could be helpful. We also wanted to point you to a previously recorded webinar that's available through Web WellMD that's also linked here about how to talk to young people about COVID-19. If this is salient to you, that webinar may be something that's helpful and is also available for CME credit. We've also listed down here several of the different links that would be helpful for your family. I know when you Google search things, it can be challenging to figure out what are the most credible or what are the best sites to look at. So these are ones we recommend that are gonna provide you the best guidance as possible. Next slide, please. Additionally, we wanna turn your attention to the other webinars that are coming up in this series around positive parenting during COVID-19. Um, next week, Monday, May 4th at noon, we have communicating as a family in times of crisis. And the following week, we have adapting to change, maintaining structure and keeping families healthy. We know 
that there are a variety of different tasks that you are being asked to do as a parent. And we hope that these other webinars will help supply you with support and information on how to tackle the many different roles as teacher you have right now. Next slide. Oh. So we have information here on how to claim your CME credit. Um, and so that will also be available for you. Um, and now I think we'll transition to opening up for questions. Okay, we had a number of questions come in. Um, first, we have some questions around active ignore. Um, when doing active ignoring, do you introduce what you're doing or just start ignoring? I would feel mean just ignoring her, although I know it's teaching her important behaviors. That's a fantastic question. Dr. Risher, I'm happy to respond to that. Um, I'm yeah, really so glad good. this point was brought up. It's really important. Um, so you know how I spoke a little bit about transparency? This is a moment where transparency can be very, very helpful and it is shifting it to cueing your child in to the skills and strategies you will be learning. So we recommend often providing an explanation to your child before you begin using active ignoring to let them know you're ignoring the behavior. You're not ignoring them. Um, cluing them into that will also help them understand what you're doing and reduce that feeling that you're ignoring them, rather ignoring the behavior. Another really helpful tool for kids that might be younger or have trouble remembering that you've had that conversation and given them that rationale before. And when they say, why are you ignoring me? Why are you ignoring me? Which may inevitably happen, is to use something we call when then statements. It's a great way to use your verbalizations in those to very minimally remind them what you're doing. So an example would say, when you can use a calm voice, then I can talk with you. Mm -hmm. Not only are you cueing them into the behavior you would like to see that you can then praise them for, you're also reminding them that you're not gonna give them attention until they are able to use that desired behavior. So, you know, when you're able to use kind words, then I can speak with you. Mm -hmm. um, when you use safe hands, then I can play with you you're reminding them of that piece that you've already shared. Dr. Arisha, is there anything you wanna to add to that piece? No, I mean, I think that, I think you kind of, you covered, you covered the bulk of it. I guess another, another piece I would just kind of piggyback on is recognizing that sometimes we also experience, um, and I think I saw a few questions pop up around this too. We also experience um, sometimes the behavior getting worse before it gets better or when we start to kind of begin to engage in that active ignore strategy, even if we've let our child know what to expect, that, that they may escalate more and really try a lot harder to be getting our attention in that moment. And this is what, um, what we refer to as, as an extinction burst, where kind of the behavior is going to go up and it's going to get a lot worse. But if you can hold on to that active ignoring skill, and continue to, um, to actively ignore in that moment, the behavior eventually will, will burst. There will, be a, there will be extinction in the sense that it will get worse and then, and then, and then the child will, your child will realize, you know what, hey, this actually isn't giving me what the, the response I'm used to getting, right? And, um, and so that's gonna, that's gonna really help with, um, with reducing that behavior over time. And so you might see a little spike in that behavior each time that you engage in active ignore, but over time, that behavior will, will go down and eventually extinguish. I'm glad you brought that up, Dr. Richer. Um, just before we jump to the next question, exactly, that extinction burst is actually an indication that you are hitting the right thing. We actually yeah. wanna see that happen because it means what they're learning is that behavior did not work and they're trying to find a replacement behavior and they're of course going to try to escalate it and be like what can i do can i yell louder in the aisle that i want a candy bar before my parents cave right but the challenge there is the moment we cave or we break at that top point the more likely they are to escalate again so knowing that the extinction burst may happen no matter how many times you remind them and staying strong and consistent is what will make that learning moment even more optimal Along the same lines, um, a similar question is, it's hard to continue to ignore kids when, they're, when they keep screaming or crying. 
um, and they're wanting even more attention from the parents. What can I do? Yeah, that's a that's a great one. Yeah, I mean, I think that the that the first piece I'd really I'd really emphasize around that is is just knowing that knowing that that's to be expected. And if you as a parent can be kind of reframing that in in your mind as oh, actually my my strategy here is working, as opposed to kind of focusing on the fact that your that your child's getting more and more upset. Um, that that can definitely help a bit. Um, and then also kind of engaging in other activities as a parent that you can do to kind of keep yourself calm. So as Dr. Fedigan had mentioned earlier, you know, obviously we're, when we're engaging in active ignore, we are not, um, we're not like leaving our children completely alone. We're not, you know, you know, walking outside and leaving them alone in the house. We're still around, we're still there, we're still monitoring their behavior. And yet, can you be maybe engaging in some deep breathing strategies yourself? Or can you throw on kind of one ear pod and, um, and start listening to one of your favorite songs um, to just try to kind of distract yourself a little bit away from the intensity of that time and know that it's going to get better and that things will improve. Excellent. Um, our normally eager seven-year-old is having a meltdown when he needs to do schoolwork that is hard for him. He hasn't responded to rewards to get it done or punishment of losing choice time when he doesn't do it. He gets so upset he can't get the work done. How do we help him understand to just get things done even if it isn't fun? That's another good one. That's a, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm that's hearing that a lot these days. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Fedigan, if you... Um, you know, I think that this is something that a lot of parents can really relate to. Um, so no, you're not alone in that. Um, <laughs> but also this is where kind of shaping behavior can be really helpful. Knowing that we may need to start with smaller chunks as we build towards the larger goal of them being able to get the, all their work done with less support from you. Um, and kind of learning that takeaway message that you said so eloquently of they can get their work done and they may not enjoy it. That can take a lifetime to actually build as adults. <laughs> but what we want it, may want to start with is how can we chunk it into smaller step goals for them? How can we find something where really the first step is just looking at the schedule for what needs to be done today? And then take a small little break and then come back to that piece of it. Um, another good tool that Dr. Rashir spoke about was those natural or logical consequences where rather than it being you can't you know, you're gonna lose TV time tonight, of really naturally of saying like, well, you know, if you were at school today, you wouldn't have access to the tablet. So during school time, you know, until you finish your work, we can't have, we can't have tablet time. Or as soon as you finish work, you know, then we can go play outside, but naturally and logically, we can't do that until that task is over, just like they wouldn't in the school day. Um, so I think the two of the pieces can be that shaping, using natural and logical consequences, and lastly, using coping language around identifying and validating their feelings of this is hard. I see that this is hard for you. Mm -hmm. And how can we help you get it done? What can we do? Um, the, so Dr. Asher, I'll let you jump yeah, in. Yeah, and the one, the one last thing I'd, I'd add to that, just because I've been, I feel like I've been having this conversation a lot with parents recently, and one of the things that then keeps coming up is like, okay, well then if I kind of put this, this kind of more logical consequence, if that logical consequence is in place of, well, you can't get access to your screens, you know, until, until you're done with your schoolwork, because that's how the school day would be. Um, you know, then I see my kid just rushing through his schoolwork and trying to get it done as fast as possible just to get to the screen time. And I'd say right now, that's okay. And if, if we can kind of be the, have the biggest takeaway message of this, this presentation to be thinking about what is appropriate there, what, what do you want to see more of, and focusing on that, the fact is he's doing it. He's at least putting some effort into his schoolwork. It may be messy. It may be rushed. It may not be 100% effort. But if we kind of take the principles of attending to what we want to, attending to the behavior that we want to see more of and shaping and then praise him for the fact, hey, thanks so much for putting some effort into your schoolwork today or for trying or doing, you know, completing math problem number one, 
whatever it may be, um, focusing on that piece as opposed to focusing on the fact that um, that he that he rushed through it or that um, you know it's sloppy or messy or something like that. Um, so again, just trying to really emphasize the the little kernels of that positive behavior or that appropriate behavior that we want to see and emphasizing that as opposed to the other behaviors. Uh, we have one follow-up question yeah. on active ignoring, which is what to do if your child becomes violent? Great question. I'm really glad that this was also addressed um, mm -hmm. because those safety behaviors or those danger behaviors, we can't ignore. Um, and so I think once they become kind of more aggressive or more elevated, where you're starting to have concern that they're going to hurt themselves or someone else, that's when we want to step in and shift how we're actively ignoring. So first, if it's a minimally dangerous behavior, like a lot of younger kids will bump their head against a wall, that's a time where without kind of looking at them or giving them a lot of attention, like, don't do that, or, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. to just calmly walk up behind them and maybe put your hand behind their head in between the wall so they're hitting your hand instead of the wall. Kind of how can we mold the environment if it's a minimally dangerous one where we're keeping them safe while not giving attention to them? But this doesn't work when it becomes more dangerous and more escalating. When things escalate further and you're no longer able to minimize the damage, that's when we wanna use some of those loss of privilege or consequences so just time out, loss of privilege to diffuse the situation and help with safety. It can be really helpful to pair that with statements where you're telling kids transparently what you're doing. Um, I'm worried about your safety right now. If you're unable to be safe, then we're going to have to put, have you take a time out right now. G giving that warning as Dr. Richard mentioned, and then the consequence not as a punishment, but as a what we need to do to keep you safe. I hope that's helpful. And Dr. Rashir, would you like to add anything to that? No, I think that was perfect. <laughs> there have been a lot of really great questions coming in. Yeah. I think we only have time for one more. Um, my seven-year-old has been playing with her dolls and I've noticed she's playing out a lot of coronavirus mm -hmm. situations. Is this unhealthy? Should I encourage her to change the, the narrative? Oh, that, that is a, I appreciate you asking that question. That yeah. is a really good one. And I think, you know, we see, we see kids acting out how they're feeling about things or expressing themselves, especially at this age in, in play. And, um, and that's why when I was talking about special time earlier for, for younger kids connecting through play is the way that we want to do want to do that. And, um, and so when kids are kind of playing out something like coronavirus, that's a great opportunity for us to join them in that play and be able to help model what we're doing to stay safe with coronavirus, what we're doing to help take care of other people around coronavirus, and all of those more protective security components that, that are there. And um, so it's not so much about you know, changing her play or not letting her kind of play in this narrative around coronavirus, but using that play as a way to really um, re-emphasize and re reassert uh, for her that, that she's safe, that you and your family are safe, and that you are doing everything that you can to, to stay safe during this time and to protect others during this time. I don't know if there's anything else, Dr. Fedigan, that you would add to that. No, it's really, it's really actually um, great that you're getting to see mm -hmm. your, your child play this out and able to validate the emotions that the dolls are playing and she's experiencing. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Recher and Dr. Pettigan for sharing your expertise and wisdom with us this afternoon. Um, now, um, Kyle, would you mind bringing up the instructions on the CME credits, just in case anyone needs to review that before we wrap up? Yep. Yeah. Um, and also Great. this webinar I posted in the um, I posted in the in the um, chat, but this webinar is going to be posted in the next couple of days by CME on their COVID-19 education website. And we're also going to send out a fo follow up information with that link to everyone who attended today.
Um, this, the next webinar in this series is entitled Communicating as a Family in Times of Crisis, and that will take place this coming Monday and will be led by Dr. Victoria Cosgrove, Dr. Ishida Zalpuri, and myself. Um, we hope that you're able to join us to continue the discussion, and we thank you all for attending today. Have a good rest of your day and stay well. Thank you so much.